Okay, now comes the messy part, or the fun part, depending on your perspective. Let's take a look. Okay, so like I said at the start of today's class, we're really going to get into the details of PCA. And we're going to look at three different ways to calculate the same model. Remember from those, uh, who most of you read the wall paper, PCA is known by several names. One is eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix. Singular value decomposition of the X matrix. Uh, there is also the Niepel's algorithm was another way to calculate the same parameters. So PCA has got multiple ways of being calculated. We're actually going to look at every single one of these. You might ask why. Can you not just look at one and assume the other two are okay? Okay. No, the thing is every one of them highlights something interesting about PCA and shows us some new properties. To be honest though, Eigenvalue and SVD are so similar um, that we will really only focus on the eigenvalue decomposition and SVD, which even to me I find hard to understand geometrically exactly what SVD is doing. Um, I, I won't focus on SVD other than to show mathematically the relationship between SVD and PCA. Um, but then the Niepel's algorithm and the eigenvalue decompositions, we're going to spend a lot of time understanding those today. Okay, so not everyone's covered optimization. I know we have a few non-chemical engineers in the class, but most of you took the 4G class, I think it is, with Benoit, or those in grad at the grad level are taking it now with Dr. Schwartz. So optimization problems can always be written in the standard form. You either maximize or minimize, that doesn't really matter too much. You can just flip the sign of our objective function if we're changing one to the other. Maximize objective function. So we'll always write our optimization as some objective function. This is a scalar value. So some scalar will usually say this is equal to a function of various parameters. But this is some scalar. And when we're optimizing that, we're adjusting one or more variables to achieve that optimum. Okay. So we're in this box below the max. We, we're, we're changing something to achieve our optimum, right? That's why we've got an optimization problem. Optimization problems immediately imply we've got some degrees of freedom. One or more things we can do in order to get to our optimum. The things we're going to change in order to make this value higher and higher and higher are our, what's called our search variables. So our search variables go into this box, and that can be one two or more parameters that we search over to achieve that objective. And we often have constraints. The most simple optimization problems won't have a constraint, but in today's class, we'll show PCA, we have one constraint or more constraints in some cases. So these are things we have to obey while satisfying or trying to achieve rather our objective of maximizing. So sometimes we're constrained and these constraints can be quality or inequality constraints. For quality the constraints are a little bit more severe. They say you have to meet this. Inequality constraints say you need to be at or above or at or below certain limits while trying to achieve this factor. So that's the general form. Okay, so for PCA, last class I said, what is PCA trying to do? What are we trying to maximize? We've said it a few times. What would be the objective function for PCA? Okay, so that's saying uh, minimize, sorry, minimize variance, minimize residual variance. Okay. Any other way that we can look at PCA? Contributions. Say a little different. Uh, no, well, okay, that you to, yeah, okay, we can see that later on when we, um, we're just talking now about one component, let's say. What is one component doing? If we're just adding one component to the model, what is that component? In the number of the maximizes the variance explained, maximizing variance explained. And we'll show by the end of this, uh, this uh, section today that these two are actually the same. 
But for now, it's easier to work with variance explained. So we're going to try and maximize the variance explained. And the variance explained in PCA can be written as follows. We're going to try and maximize variance explained, and that can be written as T1 transpose T1. For now, we're going to see variance explained as being T1 transpose T1. Why? T1 is a vector. So here's our x matrix. Here's T1. Is that vector corresponding to the x. And T1's mean is equal to 0. Okay. I will just put that out there as, as given. The mean of T1 is 0. The variance then of T1, so another way of saying maximizing variance of T1 is equivalent to saying maximize T1 transpose T1. Because the definition for variance is equal to T1 minus T1 average, which is 0, squared. We're taking the sum of squares in that vector. And the sum of squares can be written as T1 transpose T1. So if you, I, I mentioned this in the last class. Whenever you see a vector transpose with itself, and that vector happens to have mean of 0, you need to immediately say, aha, I know what's going on here. That vector, this quantity is just the variance of that vector. Okay? So if I say in English, the variance of T1, mathematically I'm saying T1 transpose T1. It's the same thing. So the objective function for PCA is trying to maximize the variance. We're just looking at one component for now. Mathematically, that can be written as maximizing T1 transpose T1. Yeah. How do you that? But don't, wouldn't you have to compare that to the variance of the actual data? Like, how can you just maximize? That's well, a good question. What we're doing here is, let's take our X matrix. And unfortunately, I don't have that geometric illustration up there from last class, but uh, T1 is our vector. We're trying to find that direction P1 so that the T1s represent, remember, the distances along that vector. We want that vector to be as long as possible, have the greatest variance. So, actually, let me try to find that slide. I think this is a, a, good, uh, a good question if you're asking me. Uh, the notes from last class. Um, okay, there you go. So T1, we're trying to find this direction, P1. Okay. Now that, that, while we're on that point, that is in fact our search variable, P1. P1 is what we're going to adjust. We're going to move this vector around and stop moving it around until we achieve a, a maximum. What do we mean by that maximum? It says that if I take this vector, and let's say it is at the maximum, and I shift it just a little bit to the left or the right or up or down or in and out of the board, and I calculate the variance of my T1, it will immediately be lower than the T1 at this particular angle. Okay. So conceptually, another way that you can sometimes think of it is, let's Let's say that there's an angle there between that vector and, and my x direction. If I plot that angle, let's call it theta, against variance of t1, I can expect to get a plot like that. There's some particular angle that as I move this vector, the, and I calculate the variance for every single one, at some point that variance reaches the maximum, and then it starts dropping off again. There's no other direction that I can possibly find. The moment I move this vector a little bit left, right, up, down, the variance of t starts to drop off. Okay, so I, I think I remember you saying that there's only one direction that explains the most variance, right? But I'm imagining a case now where you have some symmetry in the data, okay? 
you're jumping ahead, but I know where you're going and we can deal with it. Okay. And then, to be honest, in real data sets, we never see that because there's always my new bound of error that right. prevents it from yeah. happening. Yeah. What you're asking is a very isolated theoretical case that you, to get it, you have to use simulated data. You'll never get it in practice. Okay, <laughs> okay but you, you were going to ask something else, I think, which is. No. Okay. So, so is that, that clear? Yeah. The reason why we want to maximize variance is we want to stretch this cloud of points out by as much as possible, which is another interpretation for variance. Okay, we want to make that, that as long as possible. Okay. And we'll prove later on that by doing that, it's exactly the same as minimizing the residual distances. Okay, so you can look at it both ways. If we wanted to reduce the prediction error, it's the same thing as maximizing the variance of T1. They're exactly equivalent mathematically. So we've, we've answered two out of the three parts in our objective function. So objective function is to maximize that quantity. What we're going to do is change this vector P1. P1 is a k by 1 vector. So in other words, we're adjusting k values. We're going to find p11, p21, p31, up to pk1. We're adjusting those k individual values until we get this maximum. Okay. Constraints. We've got, we have one constraint subject to, what might that constraint be? one's unit length. That's the only constraint we had. P1 is unit length, and if I want to convert that from English to mathematics, I say P1 transpose P1 is equal to 1. That means P1 is time. Okay? So there's my objective function. And you can go plug this into MATLAB and solve it, or GANS, or any tool, your favorite optimizer, and it will find the solution here those k values in the vector p1. One thing though, when we write our objective function, we expect that objective function to be a function of the values we're changing. Okay, and right now that's just t1. How is t1 related to p1? There we go. So t1 is capital X times p1. <coughs> so if I wanted to rewrite my objective function now purely in terms of P1, I would be able to write Y is equal to X times P1 transpose X times P1. Problem. Let me just write it up here. So we're trying to maximize P1 transpose X transpose X P1 by changing vector P1 subject to the constraint that P1 transpose P1 is equal to 1. Uh, yes. Just have a question. If you're, if you're maximizing the like, vector itself, like, I mean, if you use indexing, you want to have like, a constraint for that verb. Like, I mean, if, instead of using P1, you use like, PI. You want to have like, a constraint that the, the components have to be like, a problem that fits. Oh, you're, you're asking a good question that we're, we're deriving the optimization problem for only the first component. What you're saying is, should there be orthogonality, will come in when we look at the second component. Uh, uh, okay. I mean, so, so you can actually combine like all components in one objective function? Um, you probably could, <laughs> but it would be extremely messy, messy on the board. So you'll see why. We'll look at the first component, then we'll look at the second component, and uh, then it expands logically. But I'm sure you probably could solve this all in one click code. Yeah. Someone's doing research and optimization. Okay, so. Let's take a look at this. I had asked you on the on the wiki. Um, I posted the note there to please look at 
the Lagrange multiplier theory for optimization problems. And the reason is, sure, we can solve this by plugging it into GANs or MATLAB or something like that, but we can also solve it analytically on, by hand using Lagrange theory. For those of you that haven't taken an optimization course, uh, I'll just write this out and you can believe it or you can read up more about it if you want to see. But from Lagrange, we can say, if we write a function, a Lagrange function, I'll call it L1, you can just simply take your objective, P1 transpose X, transpose X, P1, add a, or subtract, doesn't matter which, a Lagrange multiplier, I'll use minus my Lagrange multiplier, times uh, the equality constraint written as a, equal to zero. So in other words, that's P1 transpose P1 minus one. So that's the Lagrange function. And so I'll call this equation one. The, the uh, theory says from Lagrange is find stationary points uh, for this function L1 with respect to lambda 1 and P1. So I've got k plus 1 unknowns in this equation. I've got my k unknowns in the vector p. I've got one extra unknown for my Lagrange multiplier. If I find the stationary points for L1, that is a necessary condition for the optimum. Okay. So find stationary points for L1 with respect to those k plus 1 parameters. This is a necessary condition. Uh, that's, a, that's to check yeah, if it's a maximum or not. And we'll, we'll see that. We'll, we'll show that it is a maximum. Okay. So stationary points, back to first year math, second year math. What does that mean? First derivative is set equal to zero of L1 with respect to uh, with respect to the search variable. So in this particular case, that says the derivative of L1 with respect to P is equal to, and here we do matrix derivatives. For those of you that don't know where matrix derivatives uh, come from, you could just see this as a set of K equations differentiated with respect to P11, differentiated with respect to P21, and then assemble all your equations together. But there's, uh, there's theorems that you can look up or quality uh, equations on the web that you can look up that help to make this easier. The derivative of this quantity with respect to P1 is equal to two times x transpose x P1. You can just take that at face value or look it up. The derivative of this quantity with respect to P1 is equal to minus two times lambda one. setting it equal to zero. The other thing to notice is we've got that equation. We also have our other equation, P1 transpose P1 is equal to one. The reason why I want to point that out is over here, these two are a set of k plus 1 equations in k plus 1 unknowns. Okay. So over here is k equations. Why is that k equations? Let's take a look. Um, x transpose x is equal to k times n by n times k. So that's x transpose, that's x. p1 is k by 1. So this quantity over here is equal to a k by 1 vector. That's a scalar, that's a scalar. So that's 1 by 1, by one multiplied by uh, k by 1. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Let's scale up there. So that's still also a k by 1 
vector. So a k by one vector minus a k by one vector, that vector of zeros is then also a k by one vector of zeros. So that's a set of k equations. Okay, and here's our one equation. So k plus one equations and k plus one unknowns. You can use your favorite nonlinear solver and solve that, and it would work successfully. Um, the other thing to notice is this is a convex optimization problem. What does that mean, Jason? The local optimum is global optimum. Local optimum is a global optimum. Anything else? Eigenvalues, yeah, anything else? It will converge. Okay. And it's a unique solution. So P1, there's only one solution for P1 that will that will solve this problem. Okay, those are three tremendously powerful solutions. We want our algorithm to always converge. We don't sometimes want to click auto fit in the PCA software and it sometimes doesn't converge. So it will always converge to find the solution. We we'll always get the same answer. If I fit my PCA model today and I fit it tomorrow, I'm always going to get the same solution. And it's a global solution. Okay? There's no other, there's no multiple <coughs> solutions. It's just a single global unique memory. So these are three great properties that we get from Anyone else notice something interesting about that equation up there? Let's see, provided as follows. X transpose X, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna make the twos disappear because we set it equal to zero, so I can divide by two. X transpose X minus lambda one times an identity matrix So I'll just rearrange this equation by factoring out the P1 vector over here to the right. X transpose X minus lambda 1 times IK. IK is just an identity matrix. So it's a K by K identity matrix. Does that look familiar to anyone? The graph <laughs> I don't remember from where. <laughs> it's the eigenvector problem. It's the eigenvector problem. Okay? It's the eigenvector problem. Or x transpose x. So if I take my x matrix, calculate x transpose x, put it into MATLAB, and I say i x dash transpose x. The eigenvectors and eigenvalues from that will be the solution to my optimization problem. In particular, the eigenvectors will be P1, the eigenvalue will be lambda 1. Okay. So that's straight away, now you know how to fit PCA. Go to MATLAB, type I, X transpose X, and you're done. One line to fit your PCA model. Okay. So just note, note here then, P1 is an eigenvector of x transpose x, and lambda 1 is, its, is the corresponding eigenvalue. And another way to write this is we sometimes will write this as follows x transpose x. Yeah is equal to lambda 1 p1. So I'll call that equation 2 over here. Because I had an equation 1. So like oh, yeah. So this is equation 1. This is the second equation. We'll refer back to this one later on. That's another way of writing exactly the same thing.
so one other thing that you probably hinted at was that for this problem, eigenvalues will always be positive. Let's just take a look at that quickly. Um, one way to see that is let's go back to our objective function. We have our objective function is T1 transpose T1. And we said, well, we could also write that in another way. We could write that as P1 transpose X transpose X times P1. Both of those are equivalent ways, just substituting in formulas over there. Well, I, you were mentioning it earlier. I probably had a mistake on it, right? There's a missing P1. Yeah. equation over here, I can substitute that in over here into my objective function. <coughs> so that's equal to P1 transpose, X transpose X P1 is just lambda 1 times P1. Okay. Or another way of saying that is lambda 1 P1 transpose P1, just back to the scale out to the front. And what's that equal to? interpretation in English of this equation over here. There's a scalar on the left, a scalar on the right. What is the left hand side? Variance of T1. What is the right hand side equal to? The right hand side is equal to lambda 1 because P1 transpose P1 is equal to 1. So we're saying that the variance of T1 is just that eigenvalue, or in other words, the Lagrange multiplier from real optimization okay. And we know that variance of T1 is always positive. You cannot calculate the variance that's negative. So there's our guarantee that the eigenvalue is positive. So we know we've maximized the objective function, not minimized it. Okay, so we'll actually call this um, equation three, I guess. So T1 transpose T1 is equal to lambda 1. on that derivation. That's the first component. That was the easy component. Now it's uh, yeah. <laughs> it just gets more fun after this. this is cool. <laughs> okay. You may need to go back to this to understand some concepts. Uh, go back to your math notes from first year, second year, just to recap some of these matrix things if, if necessary. Let's take a look and move on to the second component. So yeah, so you wanted some extra constraints for the second component. <laughs> okay, so remember extra constraints add extra complexity to that Lagrange function. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Second component, yeah. Alright, I don't know if this is on the right track or not, but would it be possible if you just subtracted off the first component? Completely from it, so you're getting rid of all the variance that you've already explained. Do we really have to even go into process then? Can we just like just iteratively process. keep doing this? Yeah. Oh, except that we have to. Yeah, no, it's not really bad. It's still because your subtraction is so far. Yeah, we'll use that in the details algorithm. Okay. For now, because I, we want to prove something slightly different on x transpose x, we don't want to do this and change x. We want to just keep using x. We'll stick to what we. Here, but we'll use exactly what you're proposing in the next, next part of the class. Okay, so maximize the second component. We now want to fit, remember, that second direction, P2, orthogonal to the first direction, P1, but the objective for P2 is T2, P2, that, that pair, that component, and the score, sorry, the loading and the score is exactly the same. Still want to maximize the variance explained by the second component. But as Yasser had said, then we want that, that second component to be orthogonal to the first. So maximize then, 
our ejector function T2 transpose T2, which uh, we know now, similarly to before, we can write that as P2 X transpose X P2. What is our search variable? Vector P2, another set of K values in that vector P2 that we're searching. We're going to adjust the P2 direction until we maximize this variance. Subject to, yes sir, subject to what? P2 transpose P2 is equal to 1. Um, P1 orthogonal to P2. The, uh, so there's two ways we can look at this, and I want to prove to you that they're identical. We can look at it two ways. There's a second constraint here. We can say T1 transpose T2 is equal to zero. The other way we can look at it is, let's, let's, let's just take a look at this a bit more carefully before we proceed with Lagrange. We can say T1 transpose T2 is equal to T2 transpose T1 as well. That's just a, a dot product, so if we can flip it around, it doesn't change the solution. We're going to get a scalar out of it. either one. It's going to be equal to zero. Let's take a look at the second version. That's equal to P2 transpose X times <coughs> P2 transpose X transpose X times P1. Would be the equivalent way of saying the exact same thing. Now, the reason why I chose to use the second version is so that I can immediately come back here and grab my result from earlier, from equation two. Notice that's x transpose x p1 on the left hand side. I've got an x transpose x p1 here. Let's sub that in. So p2 transpose that on the left there says lambda 1 p1 is equal to 0. If I simplify that out, it would bring lambda out the scalar. It's 0 on the, on the right hand side. I can just remove the lambda 1 scalar, that shows me that P2 transpose P1 is equal to 0. So what Yasser had said earlier, either T1 transpose T2 is equal to T2 transpose T1, but that's also equivalent to saying the loadings are orthogonal to P2. And of course it makes sense that I could write something like uh, T1 transpose T2 is equal to P1 transpose X transpose X P2, and that would also be equal to zero, okay? Um, and you can simplify that out to show that P1, uh, later on we'll show that that's P1 transpose P2 is equal to zero. Either of those are the same. You're just flipping the scale of the equation uh, around, the dot product dot product. Okay, so we've got two constraints now, and we've got our Lagrange, uh, sorry, our objective function. Let's form our Lagrange and then take the derivative of it to get the stationary points. Function for the second component is equal to P2 transpose X transpose X P2. With this Lagrange multiplier, I'll call it L2 uh, or lambda 2 rather, so we don't confuse it with the previous lambda. P2 transpose P2 minus 1. And then we've got a second, because we've got a second equality constraint here that we can add in over there. I'm going to call this uh, Lagrange multiplier E12, just to indicate it's the relationship between the first and the second component. And I could write this in, in, a, in a number of ways. I would normally write T1 transpose T2 minus zero. Okay, just using the standard Lagrange requirement, but I need to write my equality constraints as a, as a function there like that. But I know that T1 transpose T2, well firstly that's not a function of P2, my search variable. My search variable is P2 this time, right? 
Yeah. I'm trying to maximize this objective function by changing P2. So I should write this in terms of P2. At the moment it's in terms of T1 and T2. I should choose to write it as T1, T2 is equal to P1 transpose P2. Both of those are the same. Good proof that over here. You're saying my, my, my schools are orthogonal, all my loadings are orthogonal, both of those mean the same thing, they can prove to zero. Okay, who wants to take the derivative of that with respect to P2? Let's take a look. It's quite straightforward actually, so the derivative of L2 with respect to this, that second uh, component, P2, Remember, that's just a set of k variables that we're uh, taking the derivative with. And that's equal to 2 times x transpose x p2 minus 2 times lambda 2 p2 transpose. Uh, sorry, just p2, not p2 transpose. Minus 2 times lambda 2 Because, and that comes from the fact that I substitute that P1, P2 into here. The derivative of that with respect to P2 is just P1. Sorry? P1 transpose? Um, no, it's P1. <coughs> or, no, it's P1 because um, just to be consistent here, let's take a look. This is K by N. That's N by K. That's k by 1. So our search vector p2 to k by 1. Scalar, scalar p2 here, k by 1. That is to be k by 1. Is equal to the vector 0, which is also k by 1. Okay. K equations. So this is, again, k equations. <coughs> What we do now is we do a little bit of a, of a trick to make this simplify out a bit for us. We, we pre-multiply this by P1 transpose. So pre-multiply by P1 transpose, and that gets us um, some simplification. Particularly, let's take a look. It says 2 times P1 transpose x transpose x P1. Oh, sorry, P2. Minus 2 times lambda 2, P1 transpose P2, minus that second Lagrange multiplier V12, P1 transpose P1. is equal to 0 and, and 0 pre multiplied by P1 is 0. So let's see. Yeah, sir, are you still sure you want to do this all in one go? <laughs> Okay, so what do we have here? This time, this is now an equation. It's uh, k plus two unknowns. We've got the, the k unknowns in P2. Remember, we calculated P1 already. Um, that actually, that's one to one. So we're really, the P1 here, we already know. X we know. P2 is our set of k unknowns. Lambda two is unknown. V12 is unknown. So k plus two unknowns. This is k equations. There's actually two other equations. They are p2 transpose p2 is equal to one, and uh, any one of these other ones. p1 transpose p2 is equal to one. Now, what we have though is we can simplify this a little bit. We can substitute it, I'm oh sorry, P1 transpose P2. Okay, so let's take a look. We, we can simplify this a little bit. We had earlier that X1, X transpose X, uh, P1, we had this term was equal to zero. If you go back to that first, um, first eigenvector we calculated, we can show that that's equal to zero. That's it. 0, 
this term over here, P1 transpose P2, is equal to zero. Okay? That leaves you with a simple solution that says B12 is zero. So let's go back here to this equation. I'm going to call this equation four. And if we go back to that equation four, I'll just go back here to this, this side of the board. I have two times x transpose x p two minus two times lambda two. I can now set that equal to zero because I've already shown B12 is zero. We're all keeping up, sorry, just, just a little bit more and then it's all done. This is probably the most intense we'll get with this course for mathematics. So don't drop the course just yet based on the <laughs> <laughs> um, So just another eigenvalue. Great. So if we simplify that as you probably pointed out, x transpose x. P2 minus lambda 2 P2 equals 0, or stated alternatively, x transpose x minus lambda 2 times a k by k identity matrix post multiplied by P2 vector is equal to a vector of zeros. So now that shows again, as we had there earlier, P1 was an eigenvector of x transpose x. Here we've proved that P2 is an eigenvalue of x transpose x. So that's why you can just go to MATLAB and say I of x transpose x, and all your eigenvectors you get are the P1, P2, P3, P4 eigenvectors of. Is that P2 is an eigenvector? Of eigenvectors, sorry. Lambda 2 is the corresponding eigenvalue. Right. right, and like Shafali is saying, once you get your eigenvectors and eigenvalues from MATLAB, you'll Right, so MATLAB reports the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and usually reports it back to front from the lowest to highest eigenvalues. You so just pick, pick out the highest eigenvalue, lambda 1. The same the eigenvector corresponding to that is the P1. The next largest eigenvalue, lambda 2, corresponds to P2 and so on. Okay, and as we showed before, it's not hard, uh, we can just do it here quickly. The variance in other words, our objective function, variance of T2, is equal to T2 transpose T2, which is equal to P2 transpose X transpose X T2. That's equal to lambda, uh, lambda 2 times P2 transpose P2, which we know is just equal to 1. So again, our, our variance of our second component is just equal to lambda 2. The eigenvalue lambda 2 is equal to the okay. So that's a good result. The eigenvalues we get from MATLAB or any, any similar tool correspond to the variances explained by each score. And you'll see then that those variances decrease. Lambda 1 is bigger than lambda 2, which is bigger than lambda 3, and so on. So that's actually going to be one possible way to look at 
when to stop adding components is because these eigenvectors will get successively smaller and smaller. There's diminishing returns. You'll often see when you plot these eigenvalues, component one, two, three, four, etc., you get a really large eigenvalue, then it drops off, and then it becomes smaller and smaller. And so you can sometimes use these types of plots to make a decision where to stop. Though I don't suggest you do that, but it is one way that has often been mentioned in the literature. We'll talk about other ways after the break. Uh, just one final thing to be aware of for an eigenvalue problem. Remember, we're saying here, this is the eigenvalues from x transpose x. What is x transpose x? What are the characteristics, rather, should I ask, of x transpose x? Square matrix, square symmetrical, real values. Okay, so no complex values in x. And generally, in this course, we won't deal with complex values with anything. So if you know that, you can go look it up on Wikipedia or your math textbook. There's a number of properties for the eigenvectors and eigenvalues from real square symmetric matrices. One of them is that the sum of the eigenvalues, so lambda A, where A is a number that runs from 1 up to capital K, that's the most number of eigenvectors you can extract, is as many columns as you have in the data set. If you go calculate all your eigenvalues, and you sum them up, that is equal to the trace of x transpose x. What is the trace? Sum of the diagonals. Right? So just take the sum of the diagonals of x transpose x. Let's try to convert this from mathematics to English. What is x transpose x represent? Covariance matrix of x, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's, that is exactly right. Uh, what are the characteristics of x? We've centered it and we've scaled it, right? So x transpose x, then, we've centered it and scaled it. Think about this carefully. So it's a mean of 0. What do you notice about this? What did I say? Well, if you take a vector transpose with itself, is equal to the variance of that vector. If you take x transpose x, now you're just doing this and on the vector instead of the, uh, on the matrix instead of the vector, you're getting the covariance of x. So if I take x transpose x as a square matrix, what is the x the value in the one one position of x transpose x? What is that? What is the meaning of that value? The variance of x column one with itself. Okay. The, the element two variance of the second column with itself. Okay. Uh, the variance in I uh, sorry the number in row one column two. Covariance x one x two. Okay. So you, you've got the picture. So trace then of x transpose x is equal to. Some of the variances on of, of the k variables. Okay? And you can show then to yourself that that is equal to the sum of squares of x. Okay? So if you see trace of x transpose x, knowing that x has been centered, the other interpretation of that is it's equal to the sum of squares of x. And the reason why I mention that is remember last class we spoke about r squared. And r squared was equal to 1 minus, and in the denominator here, the sum of squares of x. And the numerator was the sum of squares of the residuals. Okay. We had that from last class. So actually, if we sum up our eigenvalues, which is known from mathematical theory, is equal to the trace of x transpose x, that is also happens to be equal to the sum of squares of x. 
it is also the denominator then to calculate r squared. In other words, it's the total variance that we start off with before we even fit any, any components. Okay. Then we can show, um, and I'll just put this out here, but it's, it's, it's not too difficult to prove, but um, so I'll, just, I'll just state it for you, that r squared for the eight component, so let's say the first component, is equal to that eigenvalue, which is the variance of t1 or t of the first component, divided by the total of all the eigenvalues. Okay. So this denominator then represents the variance in x matrix. The numerator is showing the eigenvalue for that particular component. That ratio tells you really just r squared. So if someone plots you the eigenvalues for, for this x transpose x matrix, they really are just plotting you the r squared values. Well, would be another way to see it. r squared for the first component, you just put the lambda for the first component and they divide it by that denominator. That denominator always stays the same. These eigenvalues will decrease. And that's another way to show that r squared for every component will become smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. Good time for a break, I think.